I was alone and idle, I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven saying there is work to do. I took the master's hand and joined the heavenly band. And I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I left my friends and kindred bound for the promised land. The grace of God upon me, the Bible in my hand. In distant lands I trod, crying sinners come to God. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die, and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Now when I met my Savior, I met him with a smile. He healed my wounded spirit and owned me as his child. Around the throne of grace, he points my soul a place. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I surely would serve him till I die. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I could listen to a whole lot of that. That was good. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We are going to read verses 7 through 15, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 15. We'll begin together on verse number 7. I'll read verse number 8 together again on 9, alternating our reading till we end together on verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin on verse 7, please. Ready? Ready? Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of the ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful song service. And it's been good to sing praises to your name. And Lord, we're looking forward to what you have in store for us as we open up your word together this morning. And Lord, we're asking you to help us to concentrate and put out of our minds things that would distract us, that we would have ears to hear what you would say to each of us this morning. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing on the special as it's sung, and may we focus on what is sung, 
and ask you to tune our heart into your heart so that we can hear what you would want to say to each of us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus. Oh, Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Without him I would be dying, without him I'd be enslaved, without him life would be hopeless, but with Jesus, thank God I'm saved, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Without him, how lost I would be. Amen. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. We want to thank you again for the Bible. And, Lord, I believe that it's not just the words of a man or the words of men. I believe it to be in truth, the words of God. And Lord, I'm asking you to speak to our hearts this morning as we open up your word. May it accomplish in each of our hearts and lives what you desire it to accomplish today. Help me as I bring this message this morning to be clear and to be concise and words easy to be understood. As we look at an important word that you employed only three times in the entire Bible. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would give you our undivided attention. And may you accomplish in our lives what you desire to accomplish today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Several years ago on the Good Morning America show, they were, they were featuring some gifts, I, gift ideas. Uh, I think it must have been around Christmas time, I'm imagining. But they were describing some extraordinary gifts that you wouldn't ordinarily think of getting. Number one on the list was a Jaguar 220. It'll go from 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds. All you need to buy this is $587,000. How many would you like? There was a limited edition model, they said. It was only built from 1991 to 1996. There's only 280 of them that were ever built. Now, you could purchase one of those cars. You want to get the specialized wax for it. An 8-ounce can of wax for that car is $3,400. I suppose if I'm spending... 600000 on the car, I don't mind spending 3000 on wax. If that's a little expensive, there was a 300000 gold and silver toilet seat inlaid with precious stones. Or there was an $18,000 Frisbee 
a $12,000 mousetrap, a $57,000 pair of sunglasses. For those of you with little ones, with babies, how about a $28,000 pacifier? The way our grandkids lose them, that would never work. Those are gifts, and you've heard things, I'm sure, along those lines before that kind of stagger your imagination that people would actually buy those things, and yet they're not indescribable. They are descriptive. These companies will pay large sums of money to advertise them on television, on the radio, and in newspapers, or online. And when you think about this, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 15, where the Bible says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. I believe every word of the Bible is placed there by God. When a word is used just a few times in the Bible, it ought to be noteworthy to us. And this is one of those words. You ever think about how difficult it is for God to communicate to us? You understand the how hard it is for... Uh, you ever try to get a... Uh, give me an example, uh, Nikki. Where's Nikki? Back here. She was telling me this morning she's trying to help Alana understand. They came to the service for Rob yesterday. Trying to get a two-year-old. Alana's two and she's going to be three... October, almost three. Trying to get her a concept that someone died and they're now in heaven. She was came into church and they were trying to explain this to her and somehow I think she thought that Papa had died, you know, and when she saw me stand up to speak yesterday, it was a great relief to her that Papa is still alive. <laughs> great relief to me too, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you understand, trying to get them to... Because we can use words and terms that don't mean the same thing to them. It, 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 they're on such a different level than we are and trying to phrase things and use words that they can understand because of the age difference. The Sunday school teacher was describing how Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt and one little boy said, my mommy looked back and she turned into a telephone pole. That was his concept of what that was all about. You know, the <clears throat> told you before about the little boy was drawing the picture and, and, and it had a, a man and a woman, just stick figures, and it looked like a, a man, but he put a beard on him in the back seat and they were in a convertible and, and, and this, um, I'm sorry, he had, the, he had the old man in the front and this couple in the back seat and they said, what are, you, what are you drawing a picture of? It's supposed to be a Bible story. He said, it is a Bible story. He said, that's God driving Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> you see, we talk about God driving them out. We know what our picture of that is, but her picture, the only thing they know is we're, we're going for a drive. So you understand how difficult it is to, to bring it down. Mrs. Linderman understands that. She teaches the three, four, and five-year-olds, and you have to try to, try to get them to, that they're not going to misunderstand what you're trying to tell them. Now, you think about that... that um, Gap, I mean, Mrs. Linderman teaches those little three, four, and five-year-olds, but being only 21 herself, it's not that big of a gap. But, you know, think about the difficulty God must have trying to put things in words and language that we'd understand. God, who is infinite in knowledge, uh, all-knowing, omniscient, trying to communicate with the likes of us so we can understand it and we can grasp what He's trying to say. And so... When he comes to certain things in the Bible and he's trying to convey to us how wonderful they are, how marvelous they are, how incredible they are, sometimes he, he, he can't even, cannot even find an adjective to help us understand them. When, how, much, how much did God love us that he would send his only begotten son into the world? To die for our sins. You know what? He says, how can I describe that? 
How can I get you? What word can I use that'll that'll really let them know how great and how magnificent and how all encompassing that love is? And you know what? God didn't come up with one. He just said, "God so loved the world." That's all He could say. That we could try to grasp when when He talks about grace, we say it's amazing grace. That's the best we can do to try to describe what it is. There's a word that God uses here, and He only uses it three times in the Bible. And the first mention here is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, when Paul writes, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Unspeakable. Only three times God employs that word. It means that He cannot find words to utter it. It's kind of like our word, indescribable. Paul said, I cannot find words to speak to do this gift justice. It's an unspeakable gift. Now, in the context, that's why I had us read from verse 7 all the way to verse 15. The context is they're taking an offering for some other believers. They're taking an offering for some Christians in Macedonia. And, and that's why he's talking about every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly. And he's talking about their giving and in sending this gift um, to the Macedonians. That was such a wonderful privilege and honor, and he knew that the Macedonians were going to really appreciate this gift. But as he was thinking about receiving a gift, Paul kind of becomes overwhelmed there, and the Spirit of God says, hey, let's remind them to be thankful to God for His Wonderful gift? No. Marvelous? No. Incredible? No. None of those words will even come close to touching how wonderful it is. How indescribable it is. Just put unspeakable. I cannot find the words to describe how great that gift of salvation is. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. You know, it's, it's an amazing gift because... Most of the time when we give gifts to somebody on special occasion or we receive a gift from someone on special occasion, it's because we have some connection with them. They have some tie into our life or some claim on our life, so to speak. I, I'll buy gifts uh, for my wife on special occasions or birthday or anniversary or whatever, but I buy them because she's my wife and I love her. I ain't buying gifts for your wife. Okay? That's bad English, but good communication. And uh, it ain't going to happen. You see, you see what I mean? There's a connection we have that I don't have uh, with you. I'll buy gifts for my children and my grandchildren, but I'm not buying gifts for your children. They're not my children. I don't have the connection with them. Do you understand? We buy gifts for people we're connected with. We buy gifts for our family, our friends, because they're our family, our friends. Now, we may buy a gift and give it to a homeless person or someone whom... But that would be someone who God would impress on our heart to help. That God would, would impress on us that we should um, help them and show them the love of God. But with God, you think about this. It's totally different. Look at, turn, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Romans, chapter 5. Right after the book of Acts is the book of Romans. Romans, chapter 5. Verse number 6, will you look there with me please? For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended or God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't die for us because there was anything in us that was worthy of that gift. There was nothing in us that would merit that. Here we're, we're referred to as ungodly. We're referred to as sinners. Last, and did my Savior bleed and did my Sovereign die? That He would shed His sacred blood for such a worm as I. 
Well, it's funny. The modern people, they redo that song and they take that word worm out of there. They'll just say, for such a sinner as I. No, I like the first one. That's how, that's how yeah, you have to understand, that's, that's how in the sight of God we were. He had no reason at all. That's why it's called grace. Unmerited, undeserved, that He would die for me. Ungodly, sinner, such as me. That gift cannot be overvalued. That gift cannot be overestimated. That gift cannot be overappreciated. Look to your right in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You were in 2 Corinthians. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians 6, notice with me, verse number 9. Paul writes to this church and he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, quite a list. And you read that list and you think, wow, uh, who, who's going to be able to go to heaven? You know what's great? Verse 11. And such, what's the next word, church? Were. Such were some of you. Not such are some of you, but such were some of you. Well, what happened that you're not that way anymore? Oh, you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How great would that be? I'm sure the, the, the church at Corinth, those people couldn't get over the fact God has saved me. God has given me His unspeakable gift. Hey, I was a thief. I was an extortioner. I was a drunkard. I was, and, and by the way, somebody in this room could say the same thing. But God saved me. God saved me. He gave me that unspeakable gift. He washed away my sins. He set me apart for His kingdom. He's given me the gift of eternal life. What a gift He's given me. I once was an outcast, stranger on earth, sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. Oh, but I've been adopted. My name's written down. I'm heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. What a gift. What an indescribable gift. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Oh, my friend. If we know that truth, how can we not passionately Share it with somebody else. And when you get a gift, I know how excited my, my wife gets when she, she gets a deal. You know, when, there's, when, when, when Kohl's has a good sale and then she's got a 30% off coupon, you know, and she'll say, well, this was already 50% off and I had a coupon for 30 more percent off. And she wants to always tell me how much she saved and I always want to know how much did you spend. But... Um, <laughs> She's excited, and you know, and some of you ladies relate to that. And she's excited about the deal, and you know, she'll tell somebody else about it. And when you know that somebody has a good deal somewhere, you'll call somebody and say, hey, over here at this store, they got this going on, and man, go, go get you some of that. Well, listen, we have the indescribable gift. We have the unspeakable gift of salvation and eternal life and forgiveness of sin. How can we keep it to ourselves? Shouldn't we tell it to everybody we meet? Shouldn't we want everybody to know who Jesus is? Maybe the same thing happened to the church at Corinth that happens to us. Time goes by and life begins to happen. Other, those everyday pressures of life kind of press in upon us. Satan schemes and puts things in our lives that requires our time. Talents and our treasures. And we think, well, I gotta get back to that. I gotta get back to witnessing again. I gotta get back to telling somebody about Jesus again. I gotta get back to carrying tracks again. 
but we don't do it. And we end up being pretty lukewarm about it. Oh, my friend, it's, a, it's an unspeakable gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is, is not a thing. It's a person. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. To have Jesus is how you have life. If you don't have the Son of God, you don't have life. And so, thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. Secondly, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, please. Verse number one, Paul says, it is, it, is, it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth how he was caught up into paradise and heard, what's the next two words, church? He heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Here's a personal secret kept by Paul for 14 years. Paul had an experience where he said, honestly, he said, in the body or out of the body, I don't even know. But I was caught up to the third heaven. I was caught up to paradise. And I saw things there that I can't talk about. I cannot find the words to even describe what I've seen. They're unspeakable words. I'm unable to find the vocabulary to describe what I witnessed there. Words that could not be uttered. Now, if that, if that happens today, he writes books and they make a movie of it and he tries to make, become very rich off it. But here, he couldn't utter it. Now, you think about that. How amazing heaven must be. That he could not even find the words to begin to describe it that we would be able to understand. We do know, we do know there's uh, going to be uh, gates of pearl. Not pearls, just one big pearl. We do know that there's going to be streets made of pure gold. We do know that there's going to be crystal clear rivers. We do know there's trees bearing 12 different manner of fruit. We do know there's mansions that are being prepared for you and me. But that's not all. We talked yesterday about there's no more tears. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. There's no crying. There's no pain. There's no night. There's no mosquitoes. No poison ivy. No allergies. Hallelujah. I was going through that list one time at a funeral and I said something about there won't be any funeral directors in heaven. And on the ride to the graveyard, the fellow who was working that service from the funeral home said, I want to let you know, I know Christ is my Savior and I'll be there. <laughs> so I had to change that to say there'll be no practicing funeral directors <laughs> when you get to heaven. Oh, but you know what? There's the throne of God. It's there. The Savior, Jesus Christ, is there. We'll, we'll see God. We'll see the Savior. You haven't seen Him yet. Whom having not seen, we love. We're going to see Him then. We'll talk to Him. We'll live in His presence. I, don't, I, don't, I think, you know, in, in Revelation chapter 1, when John gets the revelation and he, and he, gets, a, he gets to see Jesus Christ, if you read John 1, 
John, by the way, John was one of the closest disciples that Jesus had. He was the one who leaned on his breast when they would eat. He was, he was referred to oftentimes as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And yet when he saw the glorified Christ, you know what it says in, Rome, in Revelation chapter 1? I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He was so amazed and so in awe of the glorified Christ. Don't, don't think, hey man, I'll just run up and high five Jesus. You have no idea. You have no idea. You'll be in such awe of his presence and we'll just have to fall on our face before him. It's, un, it's unspeakable words. We say, what's it look like here? There won't be words to come out. It'd just be impossible. Unbelievable. Think about some of the songs in the songbook about heaven. Just over in the glory land. When we all get to heaven, in the sweet by and by, I'll meet you in the morning. Mansion over the hilltop. The eastern gate. The unclouded day. Touring that city. What a day that'll be. Zion's hill. On and on and on and on. Songs about heaven. And how wonderful it's going to be. How beautiful heaven must be, sweet home of the happy and free, a haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. If it's possible to be homesick for a place you've never been, I'm homesick for heaven. Be incredible unspeakable words. No way to describe it. The third time that this word is used is 1 Peter chapter 1. The first is unspeakable gift. The second is unspeakable words. The third one is 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to your right in your book. If you get all the way to the last book, Revelation, and come back to your left, you'd have Jude and then 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. Then you have 2 Peter. Then you'll find 1 Peter. And it's chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse <coughs> excuse me, verse number seven. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He's talking here about the trials that these Christians were going through. The time of testing that they were going through for the cause of Christ. But no, joy, joy doesn't depend on our circumstances. Joy doesn't depend on what we have. Joy depends on whose we are. Who do you belong to? Joy, joy doesn't depend on your circumstances. Joy depends on your communion with God. That's where your joy comes from. What did David say in the psalm? In your presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures evermore. That's where the joy comes from. That's where you get your joy. Peter's not urging them to rejoice over trials or rejoice over tribulations. He's telling them you can rejoice in your trial and in your tribulation because of who you belong to. Look at Acts chapter 5. <coughs> Peter's not just telling them something that he's never been through. Acts chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. There are now well established in the church in Jerusalem. The church is multiplying with believers. They've been arrested and for preaching and thrown into the prison, thrown into jail, so to speak. And of course, as soon as they got out, they went to preaching again. And they told him not to preach, in fact, go all the way down to verse number 40 of Acts 5. It says, And to him they agreed, <coughs> excuse me, and when they had called for the apostles and what church? 
beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed from the, from the presence of the council doing what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They got beaten for preaching Jesus. And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Him. They still had joy unspeakable in the midst of their trial. You see, it has nothing to do with happiness. I'll, I'll help you with something today. You know, we, we have a false, there's a false premise that people get. Happiness, happiness, it really comes from a Latin word that we get our word chance from. And we get the idea that, well, it's okay for me to do this because it makes me happy and God wants me to be happy. Doesn't he? Yeah, I'm not saying God wants you to be miserable. But God does say you can be joyful. And there's a difference between joyful and being happy. Happy is always based on what's outside of me. Everything is good. Bills are paid. Feel good. Health is good. I like the, the sun or I like the snow or I like the weather. Hey, man, I'm happy. But if any of those things aren't true, then don't get close to me. Don't get near me. <laughs> Buddy, I'll tear into you. No, 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 no. Joy comes from what's within, not from what's without. So don't, God, don't, don't, get, don't fall into that, that false premise that, well, whatever makes me happy, that's what God wants for me. No, God desires anything that will make you holy, not happy. And the truth is, if I desire holiness and I desire God-likeness and godliness, then I will have happiness as a byproduct. Happiness is never the goal. Happiness comes as a byproduct. Joy is the goal. And joy comes from within. Joy, we learn in RRU, is a cheerful, calm delight in a particular circumstance, or I just say a cheerful, calm delight in the circumstances of life. Things that, no matter what comes along, I can have a cheerful, calm delight. Why? Because of what's inside, not what's outside. These guys are beaten. Paul and Silas, when they're in Philippi, are get put in the jail and the inner prison in stocks. And what are they doing? Singing and praising God. You know, are they praising God and singing because they were in jail? No, it wasn't because of where they were or what's on the outside. It was what was inside of them. And that couldn't stay in. 1 Peter 1.8 is talking about that great joy that fills us when we are saved. Listen, Christians are to be joyful. A gloomy Christian doesn't, doesn't even, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't go together. William Barclay said, a Christian is a person of joy. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction of terms. Nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. Billy Sunday said, you don't have to look like you fell out of the back end of a hearse to be a Christian. And he was right. He was right. The great thing is, you don't have to just work at being joyful. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It's a fruit. Fruit is outcome. An outcome of living a life yielded to God's Spirit is joy. Now we learn the opposite of joy is frustration. So if I'm not yielded to the Spirit and I'm running the show, doing what I think, what I feel I want, and it doesn't go the way I think it ought to go, frustration. <clears throat> Anger. 
So it's not to, all right, got to be joyful, got to be. Huh? No, 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 no. That's not what he's talking about. Yielding to the Spirit of God. And let His joy come in us and show through us. You know, he said back in 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll have to get back there a minute. I turned. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. You know, most unsaved people, most people who don't know Christ as their Savior, they don't like talking about the future. They don't like talking about death. Huh. We don't talk about that. Two things we don't talk we don't, we don't. Two things are always certain, death and taxes. And we don't want to talk about either one of them. In politics. But you know, when you become a Christian, you like to talk about the future. Because we have a bright future. We have a lot to look forward to. I'm going to live forever in heaven. This, this is just a, just a short time. I was looking for a... Is there a pencil up here somewhere? No, 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 no. I need old-fashioned pencil. That's all right. That's all right. You, you, can you, how many of you remember what a pencil looks like? Old-fashioned kind. Remember that? No. Had a guy when I was in high school, he held the pencil up. And he had a long, long number two pencil with that eraser at the end. He said, now, this is a poor illustration, but he said it, it'll hopefully get the truth across. He said, let's let this pencil represent eternity. And this little eraser here represents right now. Are you going to live for that little eraser? You're going to live for that, or are you going to live for this? Hmm? I'm gonna, I decided I'm going to live for eternity, not for time. Not for now. Don't, don't waste your life living for now. Live for eternity. And then you know what? You don't mind talking about the future. Because you've got a bright future ahead of you. We're going to go to heaven one day. That's why he says we'll rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The songwriter who wrote that he got the words from the, to the song right from that verse. I found His grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the last line says, the half has never been told. He's right. He's right. Because it's unspeakable. <laughs> you can't find enough words to describe it. Now, I want you to think about something. We'll be done. The order that this came in, that God put it in the Bible. God, God does everything decently and in order. First, it was the unspeakable gift. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Salvation through Jesus Christ. The gift of eternal life. Then, second, were unspeakable words. I couldn't find the words to be able to utter how wonderful heaven is. It's the words, the walk, the communion we have with Jesus. But the third was unspeakable joy. There's great joy that comes. When you have the gift of eternal life, you get the opportunity to walk and talk and commune with Jesus, and He fills your life with joy. I don't know about you, it doesn't get any better than that. I'd, I'd like to describe it to you, but it's unspeakable I just wish you could experience it unspeakable gift 
unspeakable words, unspeakable joy. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for putting this word in the Bible just three times. But each time, giving is something that's just indescribable. It's, there's no words to be found that you could have chosen that we would have been able to comprehend. Just how amazing and incredible and outstanding and awesome it really is. And Lord, I, I want to ask you today to speak to hearts this morning. That if any in this room today has never received that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, they never really have understood that they were a sinner. And they were to pay a sin debt for their sin, death and hell. But that's why Jesus came. He died for them. He died for us. He took our place. You raised Him from the dead after three days, saying you, you have accepted your Son's payment for our sin. And now we must by faith accept Him as our Savior. And You'll allow us to receive the gift of eternal life and we shall be saved. Lord, if someone in this room has never called on Jesus and asked Him to be their Savior and receive that unspeakable gift of eternal life, I pray they do so this morning. Those who are saved, may we thank You for that great gift. May we thank you for a place that's called heaven. May we thank you for the joy that you bring to our lives. Despite any circumstances of life, we have joy unspeakable and full of glory.